Um, just keep your hands by your sides rather than holding your hand out. And uh, I'll put the wafers down behind me on the communion table and uh, pray for God to bless you without touching you. And so uh, we'll all remain standing for um, receiving communion. Please don't kneel at the rail um, so that we're not all touching the rail. And some people will need to stand so it's easier if we're all happy to do the same there. I've mentioned the, the video and uh, folk potentially watching at home who are not able to be with us this morning, so that will be a, available, God willing, from 6 o'clock this evening. And I'm not sure how much it will be edited, um, but so uh, if you at some point go give a, a wave to the camera or, or smile or go up at the end of the service and greet those um, who are watching, that would be lovely. Next Sunday, uh, we plan to have morning prayer here at nine o'clock as well. And I think we're very close to capacity with the number of people that we've got here, bizarrely. Um, for us to stay two metres distant from one another, we could perhaps fit one or two more in there, but we need to be aware that um, there's a possibility there might be too many people here to be able to be in the building at the same time, and so uh, some may have to be turned away, and if, you're, um, if that has to happen, very sorry, but we do leave a note of your name and we'll make sure you have a place reserved for the following week. Our preacher this morning is Tim Conn from St Nicholas Church. Thank you very much, Tim, for coming to preach. And so uh, very grateful that you're willing and able to be with us in person. It may be that some of the preachers over the next few weeks, one or two, may not be able to be physically here and we might put up a, a screen for, just for the sermon to watch the recording as uh, it's originally been planned to be a, a recording. Thomas will be reading for us, Thomas is behind me here, and Harry, as well as playing the organ, is leading the prayers this morning. Let's have a moment of silence to focus our thoughts on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turning to the front of our service card, we pray together. <laughs> Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Through Christ our Lord, Amen. God spake these words and said, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have none other gods but me. Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Honour thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbour, thou shalt not covet thy neighbour's house nor anything that is his. Lord, Lord have, have mercy on us, us and write all these thy laws in our hearts. Grant, O Lord, we beseech thee, that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by thy governance, that thy church may joyfully serve thee in all godly quietness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we turn to the Bible for our two readings.
Good morning. Our first reading is taken from page 346 of the Red Bibles that you have in your pews. Page 346. And it comes from 1 Kings, chapter 8, verses 54 to 61. When Solomon had finished all these prayers and supplications to the Lord, he rose before the altar of the Lord, where he had been kneeling with his hands spread out toward heaven. He stood and blessed the whole assembly of Israel in a loud voice, saying, Praise be to the Lord, who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. May the Lord our God be with us as he was with our ancestors. May he never leave us nor forsake us. May he turn our hearts to him, to walk in obedience to him and keep the commands, decrees and laws he gave our ancestors. And may these words of mine, which I have prayed before the Lord, be near to the Lord our God day and night, and that he may uphold the course of his servant and the cause of his people Israel according to each day's need so that all peoples of the earth may know that the Lord is God, and that there is no other. And may your hearts be fully committed to the Lord our God, to live by his decrees and obey his commands, as at this time. This is the word of the Lord. And would you please stand for the second reading, which is the Gospel. Instead of Philippians, you can find it on page 1179 if you wish. The Pew Bibles 1179. Taken Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 30, and is headed, Do Everything Without Grumbling. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my presence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfil his good purpose. Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky. As you hold firmly to the word of life, and then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labour in vain. But even if I am being poured out like a drink, offering on the a drink offering on the sacrifice, and service coming from your faith. I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you should be glad and rejoice with me. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I may also be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, but not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy has proved himself because as a son of his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope therefore to send him soon, as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you Ephroditus, my brother, co-worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because he has heard you because you heard he was ill. Indeed he was ill and almost died, but God has mercy on him, and, and not on him only by also, but on me. So spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I am all more eager to send to him, so that you will see him again. You may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. So then, welcome him and the Lord with great joy, and honour people like him because he almost died for the work of Christ. He risked his life, life to make up the help of you. He risked his life to make up for the help you yourselves could not give. This is the Gospel of the Lord. As we remain standing, a very brief reading from the Gospel of John as well. Uh, John 14, verse 5, Thomas said to the Lord Jesus, Lord, we don't know where you're going, so how can we know the way? Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. 
turning to our service cards again. Uh, we're going to say the creed and uh, this joyful affirmation of our core beliefs as Christians together. I think it's a good thing that we say it together and uh, confidently uh, say it as though we believe it. Normally that would mean I would want to encourage people to say it loudly, um, but in the current circumstances I feel I have to encourage you to mumble it. Um, let's uh, reasonably quietly but assuredly affirm these great truths. I believe in one God, the, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and, and, earth, and, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us and the conscious palace. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the wicked and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and Giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spake by the prophets. And I believe one Catholic and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated and take Good morning. Let me extend my welcome, um, especially to those who are at home, and we'll say to all of you. Lockdown has seen a boom in remote learning from children to maybe people who are on furlough and want to continue their personal development. I recently saw an advert for a company offering online courses in a wide variety of subjects. And their marketing strategy focused on emphasizing the quality of their instructors. The one I saw a trailer for was an online cookery course led by Gordon Ramsay. I know his television personality can be quite divisive, but he's undeniably one of the world's great chefs. His restaurants have been awarded 16 Michelin stars. And if you read his Wikipedia page, and learn about his early career, you'll see an impressive list of highly acclaimed chefs who took the young Gordon Ramsay under their wings. Marco Pierre White at Harvey's, Albert Roux at Le Gavroche, Michelin star chef after Michelin star chef, each of whom mentored Ramsay and helped to form him into the culinary expert that he is today. In the trailer, Ramsay says, watch carefully, stay close every step of the way, I'm going to teach you methods, secrets that I'm teaching to some of the best chefs in the world today. There's this line of transmission from the world's great chefs through, to, through Gordon Ramsay to you at home. The reason I found this business model so compelling is due to the fact that so much of our development comes from imitating others. I think that Paul understood this. He understood the power of following the examples of individuals mature and well-versed in their subject. And therefore, what he's offering to the Philippians in this passage was a masterclass on how to be united with Christ. Last week in Philippians 2, verses 1 to 11, we read, we read that in our relationships with one another, we are to have the same attitude of mind as Christ Jesus 
That's our call as followers of Jesus here today. Paul doesn't want that to be an abstract idea in our mind, but he wants these truths to, to deeply affect our daily life. But, you know, what, what does that mean and how can we do it? Look at and imitate these people, says Paul. Firstly, imitate Jesus in his humility. Did you notice that our passage today started with the word therefore, or equivalently, because of what has just been written, do the following. In the previous verses, Paul praises Jesus for his, his humility and obedience. Humility and obedience that led Jesus to death on the cross, and out of the throne room of God and into the form of a human. Therefore, Paul continues, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, such that every knee should bow. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. There's this trait, there's this chain of logic that Paul is explaining to us. You've got Jesus' humility and obedience, which led to his death, and that links to God exalting him. And that links to our response. Paul says to the Philippians, Jesus humbled himself and obeyed his heavenly Father, therefore you must continue to obey your heavenly Father. Jesus was exalted and vindicated, as we too one day will be. Therefore, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Christ is our supreme example, the supreme example of humility and obedience, compassion and love. And he's also the first fruit of what is to come. God raised him from the dead and glorified him such that every knee should bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is God. Notice that the passage says that we are to work out our salvation, not work for our salvation. We already have it. A saved child of God is who you are. And if that's not compelling enough, Paul continues, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who already works in you to will and to act to fulfil his good purpose. I think there's an amazing balance in this passage. Paul isn't saying, Jesus did his bit, now it's all on you. Nor is it saying, let go and let God. Rather, this passage implores us to imitate Christ with the full confidence of our salvation already being assured and because God is already working inside us. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. These verses should inspire Christian contentment within us. Contentment because we have this secure salvation and hope for the future. On the long journey out of Egypt and into the promised land, the Israelites were hungry and thirsty in the desert, and they complained and they grumbled against God and against Moses. If only we had died by the Lord's hand in Egypt, there we sat round pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted, but you have brought us out in the, into this de desert to starve this entire assembly to death. They complained because they had forgotten where they came from and to where they were going. The Lord had dramatically freed them from Pharaoh. Not only were they slaves in Egypt, but at one point Pharaoh even ordered that all the baby Israelite boys were thrown into the Nile. To long for a return to Egypt was a grave error. Similarly with us today, that there will be trials, and I don't want to minimise that. I'm sure that the hunger felt by the Israelites in the desert was very real. But we must not lose sight of where we've come from and where we're going. Furthermore, not grumbling and arguing must be a natural consequence of verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had. If this is how we are to treat each other, like Christ, 
then that's got to mean that we all get along better. I know that in church each of us is bound to get things wrong, and we will disagree from time to time. But as we imitate Christ, we will start to be in step more and more. With our eyes on Jesus, as we hold on to the word of life, we will glow, we will become famous and pure, we will shine like stars. Against the black background of space, stars glow with intense brightness, such that they stand out to us, even at utterly unfathomable distances. Dear friends, this is our calling. Perseverance is difficult. Being humble and obedient is difficult. It means doing things that may feel beneath us, and it means practicing self-denial. Yet it is not in vain. Remember Christ's exaltation. Remember that God is already working in you. Be glad and rejoice. Secondly, imitate those who care about the well-being of others. Timothy was Paul's friend and fellow gospel worker. He travelled with Paul and was mentored by him. And so it's with great confidence that Paul can say the following, I have no one else like him who will show genuine concern for your welfare. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. Paul is using similar, languages, similar language to verses 3 and 4. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. This is someone who gets it, says Paul. <laughs> Timothy has the same attitude of mind as Christ. If you want to see what it looks like to follow Christ and to have God working inside you, look at Timothy. Timothy has amazing credentials. He learned directly from Paul who met Jesus. He is amongst the, most, the wisest and most mature Christians that Paul knows. When Timothy arrives at Philippi, he has every right to command the place of honour, to demand everyone's attention whilst he imparts his wisdom. Yet that's not what he's like. Timothy saw how Jesus humbled himself, and now for Timothy to put himself first is unthinkable. Nor is Timothy living a life of self-denial, detached from the world. He genuinely cares about the well-being of the Philippians. It's not a fake humility or humility for humility's sake. Rather, it is born out of love for his fellow believers in Philippi, as well as for Christ. Thirdly, emulate those who have proved themselves in hardship. Paul gives another example of someone who is living out his calling to emulate Christ, Epaphroditus. He wasn't necessarily a great teacher and leader like Timothy, but to Paul he was invaluable. <coughs> Paul speaks affectionately of him, my brother, co-worker, fellow soldier. While Paul was in prison, he was utterly dependent on the support of others for his survival. And so the Philippian Christians clubbed together to give Paul some money and they sent Epaphroditus. I'm sure taking money across the ancient Near East was not glamorous work. It was probably quite dangerous and tiring. I, we can probably imagine that Epaphroditus had to worry about um, attacks from wild animals, shipwreck, hunger, thirst, muggings, disease. Indeed, we learn in verse 27 that Epaphroditus was ill and almost died. Yet see how Epaphroditus loved the Philippians. Verse 26. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard he was ill. What an example this is to us. He was sent on this dangerous mission which nearly killed him. And yet he's worried about his friends in Philippi back home who were worrying about him. Epaphroditus does not seek his own glory. He cares deeply about the needs of others, and through great personal, personal sacrifice, he sought to meet the needs of Paul. When we think back to the, Christ, the great Christians of the New Testament, how many of us would think of someone like Epaphroditus, the, lone, the lowly Philippian courier? What is Paul's instruction in the letter regarding Epaphroditus? 
Welcome him in the Lord with great joy and honour people like him. Epaphroditus knew how Jesus humbled himself and made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. Epaphroditus knew that that had led Jesus to his death. Epaphroditus knew that God raised Jesus from the dead and exalted him to the highest place. In light of those truths, Epaphroditus served others, even though it very nearly led to his death. If you want a practical example of what it looks like to follow Jesus, look at Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus and Timothy were, pro were probably very different men with different talents, strengths and weaknesses. Both of them, however, had been captivated by Jesus' example. They loved others dearly and sought with all of their might to put others ahead of themselves and to glorify Christ. Do you see people like Timothy and Epaphroditus in our own church family? People who don't seek their own praise but look to the welfare of others, often at great personal cost. People who give generously of their money, time and strength. People who minister to us and disciple us because they love us and they love the Lord Jesus. That is our calling. Join me in prayer. Father, thank you so much for sending your son Jesus to earth to die on the cross for us. Help us to understand something of his sacrifice. Help us to give you the praise you are due and to have the same attitude of mind of Christ towards one another. Thank you that you are working inside us. Help us to shine like stars as we hold out and hold on to the word of life. Amen. Spirit, present with us now. You are the peace of all things calm. You are the place to hide from harm. You are the light that shines in the dark. You are the heart's eternal spark. You are the door that's open wide. You are the guest that waits inside. Lord, as we celebrate opening our church again for worship today, we pray for all those affected by coronavirus. Keep us, good Lord, under the shadow of your mercy. Sustain and support the anxious. Be with those who care for the sick. And lift up all who are brought low. That we may find comfort knowing that nothing can separate us from your love in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. And as we give thanks that we can again be together as a church family, we pray that you will fill your church with vision and hope. Give grace to our bishops, Peter and Ruth, to our rector, John T, and to Tim, who is with us today. We pray, Lord, that you will guide them and go with them, inspire them to know your will, and strengthen them to fulfil it. And as life slowly returns to normal, May ours be a church where, guided by the Holy Spirit, the audacity to do something new, to grow your kingdom, embracing our whole church family in this place, will be stronger than the habit of doing things as they've always been done. Make us alert to see the fresh opportunities you are always giving us, and grant us the courage and the will to seize and use. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. For our world at this challenging and precarious time, let not the needy be forgotten, nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Lord, have compassion on a world where rich and poor are separated by selfishness and lack of understanding. Bless all who work for the relief of poverty. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
We pray for this parish, this benefits for those who live here and for those who visit this place. And we pray for Diane and Roger as they move later in the week to a new life and new adventures. We thank you for all they have done for us and the work they have done in your name. We will miss them. And they will always have a special place in our hearts. Go with them as we wish them fulfillment and every happiness. In our cycle of prayer, we pray especially for those who live in the Fairy Lane. May they know your love, and may you uphold them in times of anxiety and distress. Speak your word of peace in their midst. Help us to serve one another as Christ has served us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In every hospital, in every suffering person, we long for God's healing to comfort and restore. And let us in a moment of silence pray for those who are ill or distressed and who are known to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And everyone who mourns, in all who are dying, we long for God's peace to come. We remember with deep gratitude those who have left their mark on our lives by giving us love and giving us laughter, but have now gone before us. And as we remember them, we commit ourselves, one another, and our whole life to Christ our Lord. So merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Ye that do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins and are in love and charity with your neighbours and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God, sitting or meekly kneeling on your knees. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and bewail our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed, by thought, word and deed, against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent, and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings. The remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. For thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in newness of life, to the honour and glory of thy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all them that with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon us, pardon and deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and bring us to life everlasting through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.
Lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. Let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is right to do. It is very neat, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto thee, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty Everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee, and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are the full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. We do not presume to come to this our table, O merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in our own offering grace and mercies. We are, we are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs under thy table. But thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have for mercy. Grant us therefore, gracious Lord, so to be the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and our souls are washed in his precious blood. And that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of thy tender mercy didst give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself, once offered, a full, perfect and sufficient sacrifice, oblation and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute and in his holy gospel, command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death until his coming again. Hear us, O merciful Father, we most humbly beseech thee, and grant that we, receiving these thy creatures of bread and wine, according to thy Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ's holy institution, in remembrance of his death and passion, may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood, though we receive just the wafers, who in the same night that he was betrayed, took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many, for the remission of sins. Do this as oft as ye shall drink it in remembrance of me. Amen. Amen. And then to each one of us, I say now, and then distribute the wafers in silence, the blood of the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and his blood, which were given for thee, Preserve thy body and soul unto everlasting life. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for thee, and feed on him in thy heart by faith with thanksgiving.
Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we most heartily thank Thee for that Thou dost vouchsafe to feed us who have duly received this holy mystery with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ, and dost assure us thereby of thy favour and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom, by the merits of the most precious death and passion of thy dear Son. And we most humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in, through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honour and glory world without end. Amen. Well, thank you for coming to St Mary's. Thank you for those who have joined us um, later in the day uh, from home on YouTube. And uh, thank you, Harry, for in the prayers including praying for Roger and Diane. And this is your last Sunday here, isn't it? Lovely that we're able to be here before you leave, but God bless you. And so uh, we look forward to hearing how things go in, in your new home. We'll miss you. Thank you. Thank you. Bless. So the peace of God which passeth all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost be amongst you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.